God will bring every deed into judgment. For those of us who are in Christ, who have received his work, his blood, who has paid what we can't hope to pay, it's not as terrifying. But there should still be fear, because discipline can hurt. Christ paid your debt, but there can still be consequences. Consequences can hurt. Every deed will be brought into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Even if you have kept your secrets close, even if you intend to take them to the grave, they will be discovered. If not on earth, that on the day of judgment, everything is laid bare. But here, the fright of judgment that's deserved is balanced with some good verdict. Yes, evil will be judged, but good is noticed too. God notices every thought and deed. He does know the evil that men do. As individuals, he knows the evil that we do. It's not just in general that he understands that man does the things that man does. God also notices the good. When you are indwelled by the Spirit, when you love Him well, when you act in love toward others well, when you fear Him rightly, when you obey Him because He's your Father, and that is the relationship you have with him, your Father in heaven knows, no doubt, no doubt that you have done something at some point in time that was gone unnoticed and unappreciated. Not by your Father, it wasn't. Fear God and keep his commandments, for that is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. What we take from this is you must consider your duty, the essence of who you are, what you have been made to be and do. The preacher concludes that a right relationship with God demonstrated by fruit, by obedience, is where life is not meaningless, where it is not vain, it is not empty have a right relationship with God marked by the fruit of obedience. This conclusion directs you to also consider this in light of the reality that God knows you. He knows how you live. He knows what you think. And he will deliver a just verdict. If you're not redeemed in Christ, if you have not received him as Savior, you will receive a fair, just, holy sentence, which is the wrath of God. That's why we evangelize folks. If we love them, we don't want them to face that. One of the most hateful things we can do is withhold the gospel from those who are living under the wrath of God. If you are redeemed, if you have received Christ, if the blood has washed your sins and made you white as snow, then you will be disciplined by your Father. He's good and holy all the time. A good father cannot withhold discipline when it is necessary. He will discipline you as he sees fit, and you will reap the blessings of obedience one way or the other. And his discipline will never be for your destruction. It will always be for your good. God's discipline will restore you to himself, and he will lead you to repentance, but it can hurt along the way. Better than not. The teacher describes eternal life that begins now. That's what we're talking about. Eternal life isn't something that happens to us later. It starts at the moment Christ 
brings us into the fold of God. The life we have in Christ. Life lived like this, not in vain. It is never meaningless. Even a small life lived in a small place. Places that we have chosen to live. Never meaningless. Even if no one else sees your faithfulness, your God does. Never meaningless. So what do we do with this? Oh, I hope you can see why I like this so much. I've tried to sum it up well. <clears throat> I didn't have the exact words for the conclusion I wanted, but I found somebody else who talks better than me. He's got the eloquence. Uh, this is from a book that was edited by Joel Beakey about this passage. Fearing God involves both an attitude of awe that generates worship and action that reflects the kind of behavior pleasing to God. That is always the pattern. Fear produces awe and action. Fearing the Lord is the consequence of knowing Him as He reveals Himself through His Word, where He prescribes the kind of life that pleases Him. To fear God is to factor Him into every situation and circumstance of life, to live in that awareness of God, is a proper, powerful motivator to godly living. According to Jesus, he continues, loving God is the same motivation as fearing him. And he's referencing John 14, 15. In many ways, fearing God and loving him are exactly the same. This is the kind of life that God demands of us. And if, by God's grace, we can fulfill this duty on earth, we will be fit for judgment then. Only in and through the Lord Jesus Christ is such a life possible. Or as the preacher said, all has been heard. Here's the conclusion. Fearing God and obeying Him is never in vain. God has made you for this. A right relationship with your Maker made evident through your obedience, made possible through the finished work of Jesus Christ, and empowered by the Spirit who lives within you. <clears throat> now I think it's time for a song before the benediction.